so, if you could please call the roll and then uh, begin with, well, in fact, before you call the roll, if you could uh, read our uh, introductory comments about calling in, and then we'll go ahead and call the roll and establish a quorum. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 1-60-655-3266 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted, prompted for a participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Okay, and uh, for the members of the public, today uh, is a special meeting, so we'll be taking comment on uh, the agenda items, and uh, we won't be taking general public comment today. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, begin with the roll call, please. Councilmember Kokorian. Here. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield present. Councilmember De Leon. Absent. Here. Perfect. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Price. Here. Five members and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before we take up public comment, uh, members, we're going to uh, take item number 10 uh, first and then hold it on the desk until uh, public comment is concluded. But before we take up that item, um, I would just like to offer my recommendations for consent approval today and see if members have uh, any items that they'd like to uh, pull from consent. Uh, that would be item number one. I would recommend we approve the city attorney's recommendations. Item number two, uh, I uh, re recommend that we approve the city attorney's recommendations. Item number eight, uh, again, recommend approving the city attorney's recommendations. Item number 11, um, I'd recommend that we concur with the Public Safety Committee and approve the CAO's recommendations. On item number 12, I'd recommend that we concur with the PAW Committee and approve the CAO's recommendations. On item 13, uh, I'd recommend that we approve the City Attorney's recommendations. On item 14, I'd recommend that we note and file the item. On item 15, I'd recommend that we concur with the Public Safety Committee and approve the City Attorney reports and ordinances. Item number 17, I'd recommend that we approve the motion. And item number 18, I'd recommend that we approve the recommendations of the Office of Finance. So are there any of those matters, members, that um, like to have separately considered? I mean, we'll take these up later, but just this is for your advance notice. Mr. Blumenfield. No, I don't need to have them separately considered. I was going to, on 11, if we talked about it, really commend Dee Dee Hirsch, because we've been working with them on the 988 system. But uh, by making this comment, I've avoided the need to do that. So uh, I'm okay with all, all your consent items. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, um, let's go ahead and take up item number 10. Item number 10 is City Administrative Officer Report relative to the Annual Reserve Fund Loan Review. And Mara okay. Gaspi from our office should be available to provide a report. Good afternoon, Mara Legaspi with the Office of the CAO. Uh, before you is a CAO report on the status of the reserve fund loans. As of September 30, 2021, there were 225 loans valued at approximately 79.68 million. As of February 28, 2022, 144 remain outstanding at a value of about 68.27 million. Um, based on our review and responses received from city departments and special fund administrators, our office recommends that council approve the write-off of approximately 5.75 million in reserve fund loans. Uh, we further recommend that the council instruct departments with outstanding billings to work with special fund administrators and report to the CAO within 90 days on the status of the loans that are listed in attachment one. Uh, we also recommend that council instruct departments to prioritize and expedite their submission of invoices 
to the appropriate city departments in order to reimburse the reserve funds for special fund expenditures. And lastly, uh, we recommend authorizing the CAO to make technical corrections. These recommendations will not impact the current status of the reserve fund as the 21-22 budget does not assume repayment of the loans recommended for write-off. Um, our office, uh, staff from our office as well as city departments are here to respond to questions. Okay, uh, thank you for the report. And um, we will be holding this on the desk until after public comment uh, members, but if you'd like to offer any questions now, uh, you may feel free. We just won't take action yet. I see no hands. So uh, if you think of any questions when we take it up again, feel free. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and hold item number 10 on the desk for the moment then. Thank you, Ms. Legaspi. And we'll go uh, next to public comment. And again, as we're preparing to take public comment, uh, this is a special meeting. We'll be taking comment only on the agenda items up to a maximum of one minute per item with a total maximum of two minutes. And we'll take 30 minutes of public comment. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, my name is Jessica Peral, and I'd like to speak to you on uh, item number 16, please. All right, you have one minute, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jessica Peral, my pronouns are she and hers. I'm with the Los Angeles LGBT Center, and I'm uh, calling in to strongly urge you to strengthen and expand the LA Justice Fund and support the recommendations from the Immigrant Affairs Committee. Uh, please approve the following recommendations, 1A, 2B and 3B from the CLA report. We know that the LAJF is crucial in terms of racial justice that helps ensure we no longer bolster a system disproportionately affecting migrants of color, including immigrant survivors of domestic violence and other forms of gender-based violence. Um, I would like to highlight this with the story of one of our clients who recently benefited from our services funded by LAJF. On Tuesday last week, one of our LAJF clients won her asylum case. She has been in removal proceedings since 2016. She's a homeless senior and a trans woman. Connecting her with immigration attorneys at the LA LGBT Center through LAJF meant that she got access to senior services, mental health services, and housing support. Because of funding for removal defense, her attorney was able to ask the judge to schedule her hearing as soon as possible finishing the case in March of 2022 instead of October 2023. The client now has legal status and will be applying for her green card next spring. This is just one victory among the hundreds that remain. So many LGBTQ... Thank you. Your time has expired. Speaker, please. Please state your name and the item you speak on. Good afternoon, members of the LA City Budget and Finance Committee. My name is Waldo Gonzalez, a youth and community advocate representing inner city struggle. Um, I'm speaking on agenda item number 16. Um, at inner city struggle, we are a community-based organization in the east side of Los Angeles, also serving residents of Council of District 14. ICS serves some of the highest need and most vulnerable communities in LA. We also proudly serve a predominantly immigrant population. The majority of our residents come from Latinx backgrounds with an average of 85% of households speaking a language other than English, according to the American Community Survey data. Today, we urge the Budget and Finance Committee to vote yes on option 3B from the Chief Legislative Analyst Report adopting a, a merit a blind intake system for the Immigrant Legal Services Program that would allow legal counsel for all, including immigrants seeking post-conviction relief. The LA Justice uh, Fund pilot program has protected the due process of immigrants and kept families together since 2017. Without legal representation, immigrants face a predatory and hostile federal immigra immigration system. Immigrants have deep roots in our communities, especially in the east side. The facts are clear. Immigrants make up one third of Angelinos and contribute $306 billion of Los Angeles County's GDP. There are families, neighbors, and leaders who deserve justice and protection. We demand that the city of LA protect the right to due process of immigrants who face an unjust and inhumane federal immigra immigration landscape by approving recommendations 3B for a merit blind intake system as well. Thank you, your time has expired. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the item you wish to speak on. 
please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. My name is Talia Inlander. I'd like to speak on item 16. Go right ahead. You have one minute. Thank you. My name is Talia Inlander, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Immigration Law and Policy at UCLA School of Law. Previously, I spent 13 years at Public Council, where I managed the agency's work on the LA Justice Fund. There's no dispute that the pilot program saved lives and kept LA families together. The program remains urgently needed. There's explosive growth in the number of cases being filed in immigration court by the Biden administration. And in our immigrant-rich city, that means more Angelinos facing removal than ever before. The time to act is now. LA County has already recognized this and set in motion a new and improved version of the Justice Fund that will be accessible to all, regardless of criminal history. These changes will improve the program's efficiency by eliminating the thousands of hours attorneys spent screening people out of the pilot program and using that time to provide legal representation instead. But even more importantly, these changes will ensure that the program comports with our values as a city committed to recognizing and eliminating racial injustice. Racial injustice that is historically rooted in our criminal and immigration systems and its effects continue to play out today. I ask this committee to adopt the recommendations of your colleagues in Immigrant Affairs and vote in favor of continuing and strengthening the LA Justice Fund. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Yes, um, Rabia Sen, Director of Policy with Esperanza Community Housing, speaking to item 16. All right, go right ahead. You have one minute, please. Okay. Um, we, we strongly urge you to strengthen and expand the LA Justice Fund and support the recommendations from the Immigrant Affairs Committee, which means approving recommendations 1A, 2B, and 3B from the CLA report. Make no mistake, while we wait for the city to use funds for this, even during this hearing, immigrant Angelinos continue to face attacks from the federal immigration system and are in desperate need of the city's support for a true universal representation program that provides due process for all. Even with the change of administration, the current Biden administration has chosen to continue the cruel practices from the Trump administration. We need relief and we need the support of the city as it's clear that the federal government is not going to be providing this. This is also crucial, crucial for racial justice as the racist criminal justice system is a blueprint for our unjust immigration system. We need your support now. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. My name is Carolina Goodman, representing the League of Women Voters of Greater Los Angeles, and I'm speaking to item number 16. Great. You have one minute. Go right ahead. Thank you. We strongly urge you to strengthen and expand the LA Justice Fund and support the recommendations from the Immigrant Affairs Committee. Please approve the following recommendations 1A, 2B, and 3B from the CLA report. While waiting for the city to fund this program, immigrant Angelinos continue to face attacks from the federal immigration system and are in desperate need of the city's support for true universal representation that provides due process for all. The LA Justice Fund is crucial to provide racial justice and ensure that we no longer bolster a system that disproportionately impacts migrants of color. Getting rid of the criminal carve-out will make the best use of city's fundings, funding by significantly reducing the amount of time and resources spent on screenings, as opposed to providing legal representation. Los Angeles immigrant communities need your help. Please stand up for them by rejecting a two-tiered system that divides people into those who are deserving and those who are not, and ensure due process for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Sí, hello, mi nombre es Adelina Enriquez. Soy residente de aquí de Los Ángeles. Llamo para dar un comentario al público en general. Esta tarde pido al Comité de Presupuestos y Finanzas al que vote sí a la opción 3B del informe analista legislativo principal adoptando un sistema de admisión inclusivo para el programa de servicios legales para los inmigrantes que permitirá representación legal para todos, incluyendo los 
inmigrantes que buscan alivio después de una sentencia legal. El programa piloto del Fondo de Justicia de Los Ángeles ha protegido al debido proceso de los inmigrantes y ha mantenido unidas a las familias desde 2017. Sin representación legal, los inmigrantes se enfrentan a un sistema de inmigración federal eh, como se informa que alrededor de 6%, de 6 de los niños del condado de Los Ángeles en el sistema Foster están ahí porque sus padres habían sido detenidos por migración o, de, o deportados. Gracias. Gracias. Next speaker, please. Um, hi, my name is Evelyn Ariskin, resident of Los Angeles, and I would like to offer a general comment to the public regarding Article 3B, um, as an analysis of adopting I'm, a legal... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Is this the interpretation of the previous call? This is the verb speaking. Yes, correct. Okay. Thank you. Go right ahead. Okay. The legal system for immigrants for everyone and uh, to provide our legal relief and uh, protecting the due diligence of immigrants, which is what we have been doing since 2017. Um, the federal inform informs that federal report informs that at least six percent of LA residents have suffered from this and their parents have been arrested or deported. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Buenas tardes mi nombre es Patricia Salazar. Quisiera hablar del item 16. Y quisiera referirme porque más del 90% de los clientes de ley LA Justice Fund han sido personas que buscan asilo, niños no acompañados y personas sin, sin hogar, sobrevivientes de violencia doméstica y sexual, de la trata de personas. Por eso le pido al Comité de Presupuesto y Finanzas que vote sí a la opción 3B del informe de analista legislativo principal, adoptando un sistema de, ad de admisión inclusivo para el programa de servicios legales para inmigrantes que permitiría representación legal para todos, incluyendo los inmigrantes que buscan un alivio después de una sentencia legal. Gracias. Hi, my name is Patricia Salazar and I would like to offer a comment on Article 16 because 90% of people from LA Justice Fund, they're looking for asylum, including kids with no other company, no family or no home which are even survivors of sex violence. And I, that's why I would like to ask you to vote yes for this article in order for us to adopt uh, this legal system, which will offer legal asylum for immigrants and legal re representation for the people, including in this item. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Omar Ruiz y soy miembro de Chirla, organización en Los Ángeles. Soy residente eh, en Los Ángeles desde hace 25 años eh, y contribuyente. Estoy pidiendo a los concejales, a Craig Garin, a Blue Warfield y Rodríguez, que se apo apoyen al concejal. Eh, a, al concejal León y Price para que se pase eh, y se vote sí en, 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 la, en, en la 3B, opción 3B, para los fondos a, a gente inmigrante, eh, eh, porque es necesario para nosotros como contribuyentes estar participando y dar apoyo a mucha gente que lo necesita. Tenemos uh, la oportunidad de, de crecer y hacer dentro de esta ciudad, y ya que estos fondos se habían retirado y anteriormente nos habían dado el soporte con, con ellos. Eh, pido voten sí y que tengan una buena tarde. Hi, my name is Omar Luis. I'm from Churla. I'm a resident of LA and I have been here for 25 years and I'm also a taxpayer. I will ask to ask some council members to join Council Member Leon and Price vote yes for option 3B 
for us to have available those funds for immigrants because it is a need for us as taxpayers to support a lot of people which will be included in this and for us to have the chance to grow in this city since we have the chance to have those funds back and so i will ask like to ask for their support and ask you to vote yes and i hope you have a nice afternoon thank you thank you next speaker please Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Buenas tardes, miembros del Comité de Presupuestos y Finanzas de la Ciudad de Los Ángeles. Estoy llamando acerca del asunto número 16. Mi nombre es Verónica Ibarra y resido en la Ciudad de Los Ángeles desde hace mucho tiempo. Estoy llamando a la oficina de la concejal Mónica Rodríguez para pedirle que junto con sus colegas Gregorian Blumenschild se unan al fondo de ayuda de 6 millones de dólares para ayudar a todas las personas. En la ciudad de Los Ángeles han pagado casi 15 mil millones de impuestos y tuvieron más de 38 mil millones en poder adquisitivo en el 2019, lo cual significa que nosotros merecemos esta ayuda. Muchas gracias. Hi, good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm calling regarding item 16. My name is Veronica Ibarra, and I live, have been living in Los Angeles for a long time. I'm calling uh, to the office of Council Member Monica Rodriguez to ask uh, their members to join in vote yes uh, to achieve those $6 million to support a lot of people in LA. Uh, we have paid 15 billion of taxes and 38 billions in acquisition in 2019 which is the reason why I think we deserve this. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hello, my name is Julie Diaz Martinez and I'm speaking on item 16. I'm calling in to let the council members know that this is what Los Angeles wants and needs in order to protect Angelino immigrants. We need due process for all. I need to highlight that 24 local governments across the United States, including seven in California, have universal public defender style programs to protect immigrants facing detention and deportation. Unfortunately, the city of Los Angeles is not one of them. It's quite shocking knowing the ethnic diversity that we have and, the, and our huge commitment to communities of immigrants are, and their needs are not being addressed. And unfortunately, we are lagging behind protecting our immigrant community. The County of LA already has a universal public defender style program. So it's now time for Los Angeles, the city, to follow suit. We do not have any more time to wait. People are already impacted by this, this system. So I strongly urge you to strengthen and expand the LA Justice Fund and please support the recommendations from the Immigrant Affairs Committee. Please approve the following recommendations, 1A, 2B, and 3B. Let us know. Thank you, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Uh, my name is Sonia Rodriguez. I'm speaking on item agenda number 16. Um, right, hi, um, my name is... <laughs> I'm a CHILA member and a long-time resident of City Council District 7. Uh, I'm here to urge the Budget and Finance Committee to vote yes on option 3B for the Chief Legislative Analyst Report, adopting a merit-blind intake system for the Immigrant Legal Service Program that will allow legal counsel for all, including immigrants seeking post-conviction relief. In 2011, USC reported that about 6% of the children in LA County placed in foster care were there because of a parent that had been detained or deported. Just like these children, most of my childhood was spent worrying about not seeing my parents again because they might be deported any day. Approving a more inclusive immigrant legal service program shows that Los Angeles can lead on safeguarding the constitutional right that immigrants will have to do process. We need an inclusive sustainability funded legal service program that does not reduce individuals to good versus bad. No kid wants to hear that their parent is not deserving of legal representation because of some mistake they made. 
Everyone deserves a fair chance in court. We demand that the city of Los Angeles protect the, the right to due process of immigrants who face an unjust and inhumane federal immigration landscape by approving recommendations 3B for a merit blind intake system, as well as 1A and 2B, which ensures that the new program framework is applied in unison to the county's finalized program model across all new and existing casework. Give Thank you. Your time has expired. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Thank you. It's Eric Previn, and I'll speak on uh, several items, uh, frankly. Um, you have 18 on your agenda, and this is there's no general public comment. So yeah, so I you'll have two raising, minutes. Go right ahead. Two minutes. Okay, well, it's a good strategy because you're raising the ambulance rates, and that's a bit awkward. And you're increasing the legal spending with uh, term extensions for outside counsel, which is I looked at that pretty closely. Of course, the fiscal uh, status report, so to have all of that after 90% of the speakers on one item feels very awkward. But I think that it's worth talking about the fresh sexual harassment in violation of FIHA matter, although we don't know anything about it other than you're giving 50 grand to a firm called Clark and Hill, LLT, to get that little battle raging. And another one, We've got 250 grand going to Renee Public Law Group, and obviously we've got all sorts of work from Dale Filippo. We've got one on there for a chap who was arrested for absolutely no reason. We've got a one of the most egregious and appalling racial discrimination against African American firefighters who refused to do the dirty work of Vidovich, who comes out like some kind of a whistleblower. The whole thing is just so appalling that. It would make your head pop off, Bloomingfield, if you could if you could do your work and see. And we've got another disgruntled city attorney like that weirdo Elizabeth Greenwood, who has run up a $500,000 tab we're fighting against this guy, Anthony Kutras, who had a similar experience. Yes. See? see, the dogs don't even like it. Keep it down. Hey, keep it down. In any case... Um, this is some of your worst work yet. It's age discrimination, all sorts of, they call it, apparently we received operational necessity. They had to move him for that reason. He felt it was because they were retaliating. And speaking of retaliation, Mr. Krikorian, I suggest you and Mr. Nazarian reconnect and interview the folks at YMCA about clipping a very good long-term member's membership there because I am a critic of your This is not on the agenda. Board. Sorry, your time is right. expired. I'm you to do okay. it. Your time's expired. Go ahead and let's take the next caller. Next caller, please. Caller with the last four digits, 3299. Please press star six to unmute. Persona con el número de teléfono terminando en 3299, por favor, marque asterisco 6 para quitar, abrir su micrófono. state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, good afternoon, members of the um, budget committee. My name is Esperanza, and I'm a resident of LA City Council District 12. I'm providing comment on agenda item number 16. All right, you'll have one minute. Go I, ahead. Okay, thank you. I urge the budget and finance committee to vote yes on option 3B from the chief legislative analyst's report, adopting a merit blind intake system for uh, the Immigrant Legal Services Program that would allow legal counsel for all, including immigrants seeking post-conviction relief, of, uh, as others have uplifted and immigrants in the city of Los Angeles paid nearly $15 billion in taxes and held more than $38, in, $38, million, uh, $38 billion in spending power in 2019 alone, and they contribute around 40% of Los Angeles County's GDP. And um, moreover, LAJF clients have deep roots in our communities, 
with over 56% having lived in the U.S. between 11 and over 20 years on average. Um, we urge you to give all immigrants a fair chance in court by approving Recommendation 3B, as well as 1A and 2B, which ensure that the new program framework is applied in unison with the county's finalized program model across all new and existing casework. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Caller with the last four digits, 9163. Can you hear us? La persona con el número yes. de teléfono que termina en 91. Sí, soy yo. Buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es María Galván y soy, uh, pertenezco a la organización Chirla y soy residente de la concejal Mónica Rodríguez y estoy hablando acerca del asunto 16 y esta tarde le pido al Comité del Presupuesto de Finanzas a que vote sí a la opción 3B del informe del analista legislativo principal adoptando un sistema de admisión inclusivo para el programa de servicios legales para inmigrantes que permitiría representación legal para todos, incluidos los inmigrantes que buscan alivio después de su sentencia legal, el programa piloto del Fondo de Justicia de Los Ángeles ha sido protegido y, debido a pro y, y el debido proceso de los inmigrantes y han mantenido unidas a las familias desde el 2017. Sin representación legal, los inmigrantes enfrentan un sistema de migración federal depredador y hostil. Además de que los inmigrantes en la ciudad de Los Ángeles pagaron casi 15 mil millones de impuestos y tuvieron más de 38 mil millones en poder adquisitivo el 2019. Por eso, es, por eso es que estoy pidiendo que otorguen otra vez este alivio, por favor. Gracias. Hi, good morning. My name is María Galpán, from Churla, and also from the office of the council member, Monica Rodríguez. I would like to speak on item 16 and ask the committee to vote yes on Article 3B of this report, adopting an inclusive legal system, especially for immigrants, allowing those immigrants to have legal representations uh, for everyone, including those seeking legal relief after they completed uh, a legal sentence. Uh, this pilot program has protected everyone and has completed its due diligence since 2017. And with no legal representations, uh, immigrants face a hostile system and also because of the 15 billions of taxes paid and the 38 billion of acquisition in 2019, that's the reason why I would like to ask for you to vote yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Yes, all items and general public comment if you have two minutes to speak to agenda items only, there will be no general public comment. One minute per item. Can I have public comment on me? No. And you're already off topic, so get to the topic or you expire your time. Get on the topic. Ow! All right, ow! I know. Okay, this Number is your last 15. warning. Okay, thank you, your highness. Number 15, fuck number 15. What happens? when these poor old people are getting old and they need an ambulance. Woo! Woo! <laughs> and then you get your ambulance bill later. A Monica Rodriguez, that cunt, gives you her increase. Yes. You want to raise the transportation fees, but you want to launder that money into number 16, don't you? Yes. And that is the work of Curran DeMille Price Jr. <laughs> and that's what you do. You steal from the old dying white people and give it to the little niños so that one day they can become citizens. <laughs> then what happens? Well, sir, then they grow up and they become slaves like myself and you and Bob Blobbenboiled and everybody okay, else. You're no yeah. longer speaking to an agenda. This item. is a slave colony. 
Fuck you, okay, Armenian. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're not good. You're done. You're not... Flush him. Okay. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits, 3299. Please press star six to unmute. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Nora Díaz. Mi nombre es Nora Díaz. Soy, soy una representante de Chirla. Este día le estoy hablando al Comité de Finanzas de Los Ángeles. Les escribo para pedirle al Comité de Presupuestos Financieros de finanzas que apruebe un marco de programas para el financiamiento del próximo de la próxima fase del Fondo de Justicia de Los Ángeles, el programa de servicio de Los Ángeles para inmigrantes para el año fiscal 2122 que vencerá el 30 de junio. Los inmigrantes en la ciudad de Los Ángeles pagaron casi 15 mil millones en impuestos y tuvieron más de 38 millones en poder adquisitivo. En el año 2019 también representaron el 36.3 puntos de por ciento de la población total de Los Ángeles, el 51.4 por ciento de los dueños de negocios de la ciudad y el 71.75 por ciento de los trabajadores sociales. Los inmigrantes aportaron el 40 por ciento del PBI de la ciudad del del condado de Los Ángeles, alrededor de 306.100 millones a pesar de su distribución. Los inmigrantes no tienen una garantía básica en nuestra Constitución, el debido proceso, lo que se les niega muy frecuentemente en nuestro sistema de inmigración. De hecho... Thank you. Your time has expired. This interpreter speaking, the last caller was reading a statement, so it was not consistent, but this is what I was able to pick up. Good afternoon, my name is Dara Diaz. Uh, I'm representing Churla, and today I will ask that the committee to, well, ask them to approve uh, finances for next year, for next stage, for the Justice Fund, uh, for immigrants, and for the next fiscal year, which is due in July, I think. Um, citizens paid 15 million or billion, and 19 as well. And last year they were 51, 51.4 of uh, the amount of total owners of business in the city and 71.5 of social workers in the city. Immigrants um, of city of LA County are 3 point million. And with no basic legal guarantees, there's not much we can do and due diligence is not going to happen properly. Okay, thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the names you wish to speak up. Me, 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 me puede contestar. Se, se, señora, puede contestarme? Sí. Ma'am, can yo, you yo, answer? Yo, yo de, de, de na, 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 Mr. Herman, you have two minutes. Your clock is running. Señor, tiene dos minutos. Su, ha comenzado a correr su tiempo. Well, I'm sorry that Russia... Is gonna defeat. You're off topic. You're off topic. Get off on topic. topic. Get on topic. Or I'm your talking time's on expired. item number 16, sir. Sir, I said I want to speak on all items and, and non agenda public comment, and you're being prejudiced towards me and discriminatory. You need to get on an agenda item or your time has expired. Oh, so now that Turkey beat Armenia, you're okay, mad at your me. Your time huh? has expired. You're oh, done. You're done. Cry, baby. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good day. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Robert Gamboa, and I'm a policy advocacy manager with the Los Angeles LGBT Center. And I'm speaking today on item number 16. The center strongly urges uh, your support for the Los Angeles Justice Fund to be strengthened and expanded following the rec recommendations from the Immigrant Affairs uh, Committee in, in, in approving items 1A, 2B, and 3B for the CLA report. <clears throat> As my previous colleague demonstrated, the successes are possible 
They are there, and sometimes they just take some time and commitment. So many LGBTQ community members are escaping persecution from their countries and deserve a chance. And for many, the Los Angeles Justice Fund is their only chance of survival. Expand, expanding the LA Justice Fund to include all immigrants is a necessary and important step for racial justice and the LGBTQ rights here in Los Angeles. LHAF provides legal representation to LGBTQ asylum seekers, many of whom faced anti-LGBTQ violence and anti-LGBTQ laws in their country of origin. This fund is a critical safety net for LGBTQ asylum seekers and all immigrant communities in Los Angeles. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. My name is Chelsea Bell. I use the pronouns she and her. I'd like to speak on item number 16, please. All right. You have one minute. Go right ahead. Thank you. I am an attorney with the Immigrant Defenders Law Center and have served almost exclusively LAJF clients for the past four years. First, I'd like to thank each of the council members on this committee for taking the time to learn about LAJF and the details of this incredible program. Secondly, I cannot urge you strongly enough to continue supporting immigrant Angelinos by supporting the LA Justice Fund. As you've heard from so many other speakers, the vote in front of this committee today is not about whether or not LAJS should exist. In fact, that has already been voted on and supported by the city level, at the city level by the full city council and at the county level by the Board of Supervisors. At both of these levels, there were extensive discussions on what type of a program LAJF should be as it moves forward. And it was concluded after robust debate and research by numerous entities, community leaders, legal service providers, and city and county leaders that this program should be structured in accordance with the CLA recommendations 1A, 2B, and 3B. Not only would that recommended structure line up with the current county program and make the program more financially efficient, but it would actually, in practice, comport with the racial equity principles that the City of LA has recently embraced. There is no evidence to support a vote against what the county and philanthropy have already. Thank you. Your time has expired. Okay. Um, we've gone past our 30 minutes. We'll take two more callers uh, and then we'll proceed to the items. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good afternoon. My name is Rosie Arroyo, uh, Senior Program Officer for Immigration with the California Community Foundation, and I would like to speak on behalf of item 16. Okay, you have one minute. Go right ahead. Thank you. As a partner of the LA Justice Fund, we want to thank the city and county of Los Angeles for your leadership in helping to establish this unprecedented public-private partnership. Since its establishment in late 2017, the program has been successful in reaching its goals of building an unprecedented safety net for Angelinos and their families by ensuring access to due process for the most vulnerable community members in the region. We believe the LA Justice Fund is a shining example of responsive government that focuses on meeting the needs of the region. In an effort to continue to build upon the foundation and successes of the pilot program, over the last year and a half, philanthropy has continued to work closely with the City of Los Angeles via the Chief Legislative Analyst Office, the Chief Administrative Office, and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, along with the County's Office of Immigrant Affairs, to inform the program design and development of the next phase of this work. Um, in addition, the program design has received extensive input from subject matter, matter experts. And we are encouraged by the city's continued uh, support of the program and appreciate the close collaboration and efforts between organizations to ensure that we support a program that has the greatest possible impact. And we Thank you. Your time has expired. Thank you. Next speaker, please. This will be our, our final caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good afternoon. My name is Alexandra Morales on behalf of CARES and the Central American Research Center speaking on item number 16 and general public comment. Um, we won't be taking general public comment, so you'll just have one minute. Go right Got ahead. it. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'm calling on behalf of Carecen. Uh, we urge the Budget and Finance Committee to align with the values of racial equity and migrant justice. This means adopting a robust four-pillar uh, framework uh, and removing the criminal carve-outs. Under this program framework, we can make the next phase of the LAJF program more inclusive, efficient, and continue to build on the city's years-long partnership with the Los Angeles County and philanthropy. The reality is that our communities continue to fall victim to an unjust immigration system. The LA Justice Fund was created in response to the Trump's administration's targeted attacks on our immigrant communities. It was a step of the right direction to fulfill LA's promise to protect immigrants, but it is important to note that since the Biden administration took office, 
there have been approximately over half a million deportations and expulsions. There is simply no indication that this administration will take any meaningful changes to the immigration system that will reduce the need for local legal defense programs for immigrants. To date, over 500 families have been raised as a result of the LA Justice Fund. To, uh, due to the continued political and due process challenges, the LA Justice Fund continues to play a critical role in keeping families together. We Thank you. Your time has expired. All right. Uh, that will conclude uh, public comment on all of the agenda items for today. I want to thank everybody who took the time uh, to call in. And um, with that, members, uh, if there's no objection, I'd like to take up um, uh, our, uh, well, let's, let's take up item number 10 uh, to approve the CAO's recommendations. If there's no objections or questions, we can take that up, item up next. Are there any questions? Seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll. Councilmember Kukorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Price. Aye. Five ayes and the item is approved. Very good. Thank you very much. And then let's go next to the consent items uh, with recommendations that I previously read on items 1, 2, 8, 11 through 15, 17, and 18. Council member are there any, uh, sorry, sorry, before you go to the roll call, are there any questions or comments on any of those items? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll. Council member Kukorian? Aye. Council member Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Council member De Leon? Aye. Council member Rodriguez? Aye. Council member Price? Aye. Five ayes and the items are approved as stated by the chair. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, go ahead and take item 16 out of order. And um, what I'd like to do is uh, we've already heard this item and we've had considerable discussion about it, but I would like to ask uh, the CLA just to provide an overview of uh, the recommendations and where we are. And then um, I, I'd be happy to open it up for some discussion among members, and then I have uh, some recommendations, uh, and I'd like to hear any recommendations that other members have. So let's go ahead and call item 16, please. Item number 16, continued from February 28th, 2022, Chief Legislative Analyst Report relative to the Justice Fund and related matters, and CEO Report relative to the California Community Foundation's Los Angeles Justice Fund. Final bridge funding report for the period of July 1, 2020 through June 20th, 2021. This item has been heard by the Immigrant Affairs, Civil Rights, and Equity Committee. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wexler. Mr. Chavez, any, um, anything to maybe give us a quick overview of, of where we have, where we stand? Yes. And Absolutely. Felipe Chavez with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. At the Budget and Finance Committee meeting of February 28th, uh, your committee considered the CLA report with regard to the establishment of a uh, phase two of the Justice Fund. So it's a new development of the Immigrant Legal uh, Services Program that's being developed in partnership with the city, county, and philanthropy. Um, at that time, we presented our report, which provided options to the committee in terms of what, what direction the committee wants to take this program, in terms of, uh, uh, um, you know, we laid out several policy options with regard to the criminal uh, background checks uh, and several other options in terms of policy for uh, regarding uh, income requirements and citizen uh, res residency requirement. Um, and also um, at that time, the, uh, the committee considered the options, the, the options that were recommended by the Immigrant Affairs, Civil Rights and Equity Committee. And they, their options basically reflected uh, adopting in partnership with, this, with the county and philanthropy a framework that consists of four pillars. And as it was mentioned by the city clerk, I believe they adopted uh, recommendations 1A in our report, uh, 1B, 2B, 
Uh, the, 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 these were the regulations by the Immigrant Affairs uh, Committee. So it was 1A, 1B as amended, 2B, 3B, and 4 through 10. 4 through 10 were technical recommendations that have to do with uh, uh, the follow-up based on whatever option you choose from the CLA report. Uh, at that meeting also, uh, there were several requests for information regarding um, a 10% allocation of the funds for uh, veterans facing deportation. There was requests for information regarding expansion of the program. And there were also requests for information regarding um, expansion, let's see, sorry. So, yeah, so th those two issues um, also um, there was a request for information on the nonprofit finance fund. Our office uh, coordinated with council office and the uh, various partners, and we provided the information that was requested to each council, council office. So uh, those partners are at, at this meeting today. If you have additional questions that we can respond to as well. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, members, any uh, initial questions for Mr. Chavez? The, the one question I had, because I think um, it, it's instructive, that there are a number of different funding partners for the Justice Fund as, as it stands now. And the proposal before us doubles uh, the city's previous commitments. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, I, I am going to assume, and, and I'm going to ask you to confirm the assumption that even with that funding, uh, all of that funding, the need for legal services by uh, immigrants with connections to Los Angeles undoubtedly exceeds uh, the ability of the Justice Fund uh, to meet all of those needs. Is that, is that fairly true? Yes, absolutely. Is it a gross understatement? Uh, you know, I I'm going to defer to CCF, but I do, I do agree with you on that. Uh, but CCF, who I believe is on the call, can provide more, more detailed information on that. Thank you, Felipe. And uh, I would also invite uh, our county partners who have been working on the transition and design of the new program and can also elaborate in more detail in terms of the funding for, for the new program. But would, I would just say that as part of the pilot program, the uh, funding for the services was also, uh, were funds were used according to their restrictions. So direct representation cases were funded primarily with public dollars and capacity building, technical support and other non-direct legal services uh, were uh, supported with philanthropic dollars. Um, but wanna see if maybe Dan um, or Rigo from the county can elaborate a little bit more on this. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, Rigo here. Rigo Reyes, uh, Director of the County of Los Angeles Office of Immigrant Affairs. And yeah, you quickly, uh, certainly the uh, funding available, it's not uh, nearly enough to help all the immigrants uh, throughout the County of Los Angeles. And with that uh, in mind, uh, when we set out to uh, develop the framework that uh, eventually our county board of supervisors adopted uh, we tried to come up with strategies that eliminate uh, uh, inefficiencies uh, that leverage as much as possible braided funding from different partners and that uh, uh, address the needs of those uh, who are most uh, vulnerable and uh, what we submitted uh, to the board uh, as a framework was informed uh, by the lessons learned uh, through the pilot, as well as a report uh, we commissioned and uh, the months and months of work uh, between us partners analyzing uh, the lessons learned, the report, and then putting together a recommendation for the board uh, that we felt uh, addressed those issues. So eliminating uh, inefficiencies uh, certainly uh, was high on the list. Uh, leveraging uh, economies of scale, uh, standardizing intake procedures, ensuring that uh, clients 
get access not just to legal representation, but available wraparound services okay. became priorities. And thank you for that, because I, you know, all of that work is, um, I think, are important improvements that allow, the, the point of it is, it allows more people to be served. The more efficiently you operate, the more people can be served, which is, which is the, the goal here. Um, but even with all of those efficiencies, this program is never going to be able to even come close to approaching serving everybody, uh, every immigrant from Los Angeles who is involved uh, in a, a legal matter. Um, and if we want to add um, some element of wraparound services, then clearly this is, you know, the whole package is woefully inadequate. And um, I, I wanted to put it, start with that context, because um, I think the discussion, a lot of the discussion with the public has focused on this one single issue of, um, of universal application. And um, I think it's important that we take a few steps back to how this started. Um, the city's contribution to the Justice Fund began uh, almost five years ago. And at that time, we were in the throes of the very worst uh, elements of the most anti-immigrant crusade by any president in recent memory. Um, and I think everyone on this council saw the emergency need to be able to help people from our city who were being victimized uh, by that administration. And we said at that time, quite clearly, this, this committee, and I believe the council as a whole, said quite clearly that even though this is a function that has really nothing to do with the functions of city government, it was important for us to be able to take this step for two years to get the Justice Fund up and running in order to protect uh, Angelinos. So the commitment was a uh, million dollars a year for two years. And the point of that was to be to get a program started. Well, now it's five years later and we've continued to fund this program. Um, and under the proposal before us, in fact, the funding would double. And uh, it, it would double even over what the mayor had proposed in the budget, thanks to uh, the actions of Mr. DeLeon and Mr. Price in this committee, which were approved by this committee, uh, to double the amount of funding. So um, I, I think there can be no doubt at this point about this committee's commitment um, and the city council's commitment to helping people in need with legal services. So um, I, I just wanted to establish that from the outset. At the same time, the council was equally clear five years ago when this began um, that the council did not want to provide a situation where we were funding legal services that were contrary to the very interests of public safety um, that this city needs to be concerned about. Um, and so the limitation was placed at that time on certain criminal uh, defendants or criminal, uh, those who are convicted of certain crimes, would not receive uh, legal services funded by the city. Although they could still receive legal services from other parts of the fund, but not from the city. That was the point of that. Now, in retrospect, um, it, and I've um, had an opportunity to hear from many of the providers about this. I, I, I have now understood how much inefficiency that restriction created because of the need or perceived need to do extensive background checks before a matter was even taken up, uh, which might even include background checks in the immigrant's home country uh, to determine whether there were criminal offenses, you know, in, in the home country that might impact admissibility. Th those, were, those were issues that were taking up an enormous amount 
of the funds, resources, and time just to determine eligibility. And to me, that didn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And I don't think that that was the intention of the council, frankly. I think the intention of the council was to address situations where um, we really know what, was, what uh, the nature of the reason for deportation is. And it is an issue that has to do with, you know, serious crimes committed um, by the immigrant in the United States. That, that's what I think was, was our intent. So um, I, I'm going to have some recommendations that are going to, I think, address both of those issues, both address being true to what the council uh, intended when it started this program, which, as I say, was intended to be a two-year program, um, and also addresses the need of the providers of legal services to eliminate the inefficiencies of those background checks and to get straight to the issue of um, representation as quickly as possible and therefore represent many more people. Um, and then the final point I want to make, I guess, before, uh, and I'll, I'll have a very specific recommendation to do that, but I want to give my members a chance to speak to. Um, I, I do also want to get to this sort of the philosophical point that many have raised about um, the universal uh, right to due process and the universal right to representation. And I think all of us, again, agree that everyone in the United States has a right to due process. And everybody, uh, everybody's right to due process is better served when they have counsel. There's, th those are not questions that are before this committee. Those are not uh, issues that would be debated by this committee. I, I think all of us agree with that. The question is, who provides that counsel to guarantee that due process? And um, this is an entirely unprecedented situation where the city of Los Angeles is paying for representation in federal court proceedings that um, are unrelated to the, the mission of the municipal corporation of, of Los Angeles. It's unprecedented. This is the only time that we have ever done that. We don't provide uh, legal counsel even to people who are charged with crimes and being prosecuted by the city attorney of Los Angeles. Um, so, I, I, while I appreciate the, you know, the, the philosophical statement that universal representation is appropriate and agree with that, that does not mean that the city of Los Angeles needs to bear the cost of that. And if the county, for example, wants to go to a universal representation model, um, that actually makes even more sense. The county provides a public defender's office. The county provides lots of opportunities for legal service and due process like that, whereas the city provides none. So um, we are differently situated than the county. We're differently situated than probably most of the local governments that you know had been mentioned before because of that. Um, and then, uh, you know, so we are left in the position of, as we acknowledged right from the beginning from my question, we are not going to be able to help everyone with this amount of funds. So the question then becomes, um, how do you prioritize the use of those funds? We certainly don't want those funds to be wasted doing unnecessary background checks. But we also don't want to fail to represent someone who, you know, might be able to stay here in this country, but for some paperwork problems. And they don't get a lawyer because instead we're paying for a lawyer for someone who has committed multiple felonies uh, in the city of Los Angeles. So um, I, that's, that's, I think, um, where the council was coming from when we started this. And uh, um, I think there's been a little bit of unfortunate demagoguery around this issue that gets away from um, what the historical facts are. So um, with that, I'm going to go to Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for laying, laying that out. Um, 
I was going to try to say something similar, but you said it, you said it very well in terms of the, the history of this. Um, because it is, I mean, all of us recognize this is a really important, uh, I think, right. I, I, I ultimately, I want to see this representation become a right for all people and not just for deportations, but for evictions. And I pursued that when I was at the state legislature, uh, in the state legislature. Um, but what we have before us is not a right because we have a, a tiny, tiny percentage of the people. And I, I'd love to figure out what that percentage is. I've never quite gotten that number, but I mean, what I do know is as of August of 21, we processed about 2,200 legal screenings, accepted seven, 742 cases, of which there were 331 cases in the city. So our money, we're essentially, we're spending on 331 cases, which is clearly a drop in the bucket of the number of people who need this. And also by increasing the percent of poverty level from 200% to 250%, we're going to increase the number of people probably who don't get, you know, the... the the lower the percentage, the more you're, you're serving all of the people who need it within that percentage. As we keep increasing it, we're not going to be able to serve as many people. But I understand the need to, to increase it. Ultimately, I'd, I'd like to have it, the number be, uh, you know, not limited at all in terms of the poverty. People should have a right to a lawyer, whether they're, you know, committed a, uh, you know, or being accused of a crime or whether they're being, you know, potentially deported. But the question is, as a as a process, as a city, it's it's not a right; it's a privilege because our our funds are so limited. Ultimately, I want this to be a right, um, and not have a limited fund. And what I wanted to add to the conversation is la last time in budget and finance, I offered an amendment, but we kind of got so caught up that it never we never picked it up. And it was it was simply, and I'd like to add it as a friendly amendment, uh, simply to amend the report to instruct CLA and CAO to identify non-general fund dollars to continue the pilot and to seek additional federal and state funding sources. Just so we have that out there, because at the end of the day, I'd love to figure out a way to make this a universal right, either by getting the feds to pick it up, getting the state to pick it up, or for us to find some funding source that's appropriate, uh, even if that's at the city level, but to do it in a way that it's not going to compete with the rest of our our city municipal responsibilities, but to find to find a, a fee or a tax or something that would uh, to, that would fund this. So, just to kind of start moving us in that direction, I wanted to put that amendment out there uh, to get them to look into these different other funding sources. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer that as a friendly amendment to this, um, and and take it from there. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Blumenfield. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Gregorian, and uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think you framed it rather perfectly. So I want to thank you for uh, for kind of really well laying out what our intent has been all along. Um, let's not make any mistake about this. There is far greater need than there are resources, and it comes uh, it comes to the city at the expense of our federal government not doing the responsible thing that they need to do. And so often we find ourselves here in the city of Los Angeles uh, addressing, you know, again, we're, we're on the front lines of this. And so I'm proud that we're a city that actually steps up to provide uh, for our constituencies uh, in absence of the more appropriate governmental agencies doing their job. Uh, through the pandemic, we stepped in and did the county's work uh, in emergency response. We paid dearly for it, and our budgets were hemorrhaged as a result of that. Um, so we constantly find ourselves in a situation where we are uh, plugging in, you know, uh, you know, we're like the little Dutch boys holding, you know, our fingers in the dam and the cracks in the dam trying to hold it all together. And so this, this is no exception to that. Uh, in absence of, of comprehensive immigration reform, uh, in light of a tyrant president uh, that was exploiting a vulnerable population in, in the immigrant communities, uh, we saw just, uh, you know, so many families getting torn apart. And we continue to see that. We still also have 
a system that promises citizenship to those that have served in our nation's armed forces, have fought and defended this country, and with the promise of earning citizenship, have still yet been denied as well. And so, um, you know, I mean, I don't know how much more broken it can get uh, to when you reflect on that as well. Um, but to your point about the county, and when we talk about the need uh, for people to have appropriate defense and, and to be served well by the public defender's office, absolutely. We've seen, uh, we've seen uh, several horrific examples as, as well. Uh, with people not being served by that system. So I want to say that in, in recognition of what the county and the philanthropic partners have stepped up to provide, um, thank you for helping to uh, right what has been historically broken uh, to be part of this. We're happy to be part of it, but we still have an obligation to be mindful of how taxpayer dollars and, and how we apply these dollars uh, to not... Uh, so that we can maximize the amount of people that are served uh, through these resources. And, and that's what we're looking to do here. Um, because, you know, providing this program is also going to further our ability to help protect people from being exploited by individuals or uh, organizations or companies who like to prey on uh, on immigrant populations and mislead them that they could be helped when in fact they can't. So for all those reasons, there, this is obviously uh, an invest, a worthwhile investment. But to your point, we also, and to Mr. Blumenfield's point, um, you know, we have to also consider all of the, the responsibilities that we have both as a city and all our uh, partners in where their resources, resources are better applied um, to helping to service the needs of, of this uh, of this population, uh, and so uh, with that, um, you know, I, uh, Mr. Chavez, thank you for you know again with the the comment with respect to the um, deported veterans. Uh, you know, for me, this is something that's deeply personal. Uh, having met with a lot of Angelinos that are living just on the other side of the border, uh, who have been denied their citizenship rights um, who are in fact you know should have been provided their citizenship status but were not uh, for whatever technical reasons uh, the Veterans Association or Veterans Administration which we've seen uh, not just through this process but through um, you know by by the very same vets who uh, are living unhoused on our streets we've seen uh, uh, just negligent collapse of them doing their jobs. And so we find a lot of people stuck in the fray of that, uh, which is why I also have a recommendation for an amendment uh, because I would like to see uh, the dollars, uh, you know, a portion of the dollars that uh, we are allocating for these, for this purpose uh, to be included um, as part of this program. And so uh, I, I too would like to add an amendment uh, to instruct the CAO and the CLA uh, request that the County Office of Immigrant Affairs to include in the Memorandum of Understanding a provision to allocate $250,000 to support, uh, to provide support for veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces who are facing deportation. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Oh, I'll second. Thank you. Mr. DeLeon. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Um, uh, colleagues, as chair of the Immigrant Affairs, uh, Civil Rights and Equity uh, Committee, I know that's a hand, uh, it's a mouthful, but uh, we've uh, dug into this uh, quite extensively. In fact, debunking the, the many misconceptions around it. And um, I, I, I hear you, colleagues, you know, 100%. Um, and I know that years ago that the intention was a, a two year program with, with the carve outs, but that was obviously, you know, before my time. And um, I would, you know, and I say this respectfully, I would never have signed on then. And I don't think I would sign on to that version today. Uh, I think it is incumbent upon the city to to do our part and, and support um, this community, our community, who's an amazing fabric of who we are as a great city like Los Angeles. This is not unprecedented. 
in, in cities across California either, which is why I allocated this money that quite frankly, you know, when I was, you know, leader back in the state Senate, you know, so these are dollars that were allocated with this objective, with, with this purpose. So this item was supported unanimously, as, as we all know, you know, out of, out of my committee that I have the honor to chair and I, I do stand by my recommendation. I, you know, uh, willingly and respectfully accept, you know, also to obviously uh, Ms. Um, Rodriguez's uh, amendment, and I do recognize, you know, her, her steadfast commitment to our veteran Americans, you know, uh, um, here in the in, in LA and throughout the state of California. But I think that, you know, in the most efficient way to, to use our tax dollars, um, it's about just and, 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 and equity for our city immigrant community. And uh, sometimes there's a, a sort of a theme that is it our responsibility? Is it the counties or is it the philanthropic organizations or the state or, or is it the federal government? You know, quite frankly, if we're really going to get down to the crux of this, you know, we shouldn't even having this discussion, this debate, because we should have immigration reform. We simply haven't had it since 19, what, 1986, when we had a then Republican, you know, president, you know, California's very own, you know, Ronald Reagan. But, but here we are, you know, almost four years, four decades, and we don't still have, you know, immigration reform. Uh, because um, whoever may have been president, whoever is currently president, and, and, and members of Congress, that's just the bottom line. And here we are, sort of kind of dealing with this, you know, um, a million here, a million there, which at the end of the day, it's not even budget deaths. It's 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 invisible particles to the naked eye uh, with regards to what our overall, you know, eleven billion plus budget is. Um, I, I've said this time and time again. I think that our, our leadership transcends whatever level of government. So when Trump, and I know it's been met, Trump has been referenced on, 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 on numerous occasions, but when Trump was elected back in 2016, you know, I didn't wait for leadership from Washington, D.C. to act on the issue, and I moved forward very quickly on the issue of making California the first and largest state in the nation to be, actually be a, a sanctuary state. Now, obviously, we ran into a buzzsaw with the Department of Justice and the Attorney General, but that didn't stop me. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we got sued, and we went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in 2020, just a couple of years ago, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court actually, you know, decided that our law was constitutional on the issue of retirement security. You know, when we have so many Californians are retiring when their bodies physically give out, we went to Washington, D.C. to, to ask them to, to help us with retirement security, and they said no. They said we were preempted by federal law, ERISA, the Employment Retirement Individual Security Act, you know, of 1974. But we didn't take no for an answer. And we kept and kept and we kept going. You know, and now we have CalSAVERS program, which is the largest expansion of retirement security since the creation of Social Security. And now many other subnational governments have adopted our plan. So the point I want to make here is it doesn't make a difference if you're at the city, county, state, or federal level. Leadership transcends any level of government to do everything within your power to protect, you know, our communities that are a true makeup of who we are as an amazing mosaic that is the second largest city in America. And let me say this, thank God for our immigrant community, especially the undocumented uh, 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 community, because they have given us so much more than they have even asked for. In fact, one can make the argument that we use them, we've used their labor, we've used their tax dollars, and we haven't really paid it back. We haven't paid it forward to them. In the larger you know, scheme of things, the money that we're talking about is uh, a, a tiny, tiny amount of money. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, as a chair and, and the originator of the motion that's before us today, and whatever the end result will be, you know, I respectfully ask my colleagues to, to move forward the, the original motion that we have so we can bring justice to many hardworking immigrants, leverage the dollars to the best of our ability with both the state, the county, you know, and philanthropic efforts and, and, and build from that so we can provide the justice that's needed because quite frankly, when we tear our families apart, it has a huge economic impact. When that mother or that father, whoever the head of household is, or both, you know, disappear altogether, then we have real profound impacts that have a negative consequence on the city of Los Angeles uh, on a whole variety of fronts. So um, I, I thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to, to just share a few words. And, you know, again, I just respectfully ask that we move forward uh, with the motion and obviously uh, Ms. Rodriguez's motion is before us, a friendly motion with regards to a carve out for our, our veteran uh, undocumented immigrants who put their lives on the line 
to protect you know the, the, the tenets of, of, of this nation hey, uh, um, that this motion. So thank you much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Delia. Uh, Mr. Price. Mr. Chair, let me first of all just concur with the comments made by uh, Councilmember De Leon, Chair of the Immigration Committee, as co-chair, vice chair. I certainly uh, heard the testimony and, and felt the concerns that were being raised. Also, uh, you know, because of the composition of my constituents, uh, this subject is very dear to me, and very, very, uh, very concerned. I, I, let me ask a question, Mr. Chavez. Again, thank you for your report, and thank you for all the comments made by, by my colleagues. Uh, this is a uh, an important uh, time, I think, for us to really establish our our presence, uh, Mr. Chavez. Let me ask you though, uh, in, in in the immigration committee. We asked about uh, wraparound services, the delivery of wraparound services, and you referenced them some in your in your comments. But have we considered utilizing some existing city services, like the Family Source Center, as a way of delivering these services? Yes. So, as part of the the action of the Immigrant Affairs Committee, our office has been coordinating and having discussions with both the Civil Human Civil Human Rights and Equity Department and also CIFD. Community Investment for Families Department. And we're looking at, you know, uh, in response to the committee's request and previous council requests about possibly moving the office, uh, uh, the mayor's office of immigrant affairs to a department. So we're consolidating those requests and, and, and figuring out what makes more sense for the council, whether it makes more sense for uh, one department over the other or to both work collaboratively uh, but we have been having those discussions and, uh, you know, in the near future, we'll have a report for you with respect and separate from this on the wraparound services. Yeah, well, I, I think those discussions need to continue. I think utilizing the, the family source centers is an excellent way to uh, leverage uh, these limited resources, especially uh, in an area like this where uh, families uh, are so importantly uh, impacted by it. Uh, and just a comment, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues, you know, since these, this was launched this program in 2017, the Justice Fund has been a crucial resource for our undocumented neighbors facing deportation. And as I said, uh, uh, I represent a, uh, a large number of them in, in CD9, the same group of people who have been essential to our countries uh, and our most vital workforce. Immigrants build our community and they have certainly contributed to our overall prosperity. They're, they are 30% of the residents and 51% of our business owners and almost 70% of our essential workers uh, from our immigrants. In fact, more than $59 billion of LA County's GDP comes from undocumented immigrants, 59 billion. And yet more than two thirds of the people who appear in immigration court in LA County face the judge and prosecutor with no lawyer to represent them at all. Some children even as young as three years old. So the LA Justice Fund matters to a big cross section of our people, not just in nine, uh, not just in district one or 14, but throughout our whole city. It has been reported since it's launched, the Justice Fund has allowed more than 2,200 people to get legal help, 2,200, resulting in 742 cases. As of last year, almost 230 of those cases were completed. And that's significant. You know, it's a small number, but it's significant. There's a huge need for legal help in immigration courts across the country. I know there was some suggestion that we were setting a, uh, a precedent. Uh, in fact, there are some other communities that have stepped up to the plate. Uh, and I'm proud that we are part of a handful of local governments that are providing this. And so, although while it may be unprecedented, uh, in the eyes of many, I strongly urge us to fully fund our $2 million commitment to the LA Justice Fund so that we can continue to help our immigrant neighbors facing deportation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Price. And, and just to be clear, um, I, I agree with you about fully funding uh, this program. And I, I didn't mean to suggest that it was unprecedented, unprecedented in the country. What I meant to say is that this, that providing legal services in this arena 
is unprecedented in the city of Los Angeles. In other words, we don't provide legal services in any number of other areas, criminal defense, um, you know, consumer fraud, landlord tenant, other areas where uh, people really need help and need uh, the legal services. Um, but this was uh, the one and only thing that, that we uh, agreed to provide legal services for. And so uh, members, I, I agree with um, the statements that Mr. De Leon and Mr. Price and Ms. Rodriguez and Mr. Blumenfield all made about the need for legal services, uh, the need to fund this program fully with the $2 million that, that we've budgeted, um, with the extraordinary impact that lawyers can have in protecting people's ability uh, to have their rights heard and to be, uh, to remain uh, in this country as p productive contributing uh, parts of, of, of our society. I, I absolutely agree with all of that. I think the only remaining issue is, um, does, should there be any restrictions on uh, the nature of the case? And um, again, coming back to the point that uh, for every one of those, um, for every dollar that is spent on um, uh, providing legal services to someone who has multiple violent felonies and is facing deportation because of that, that's a dollar that's not spent on an unaccompanied minor or on somebody who is a victim of domestic violence and, and, and all the other many cases uh, that we want to provide uh, those uh, services for. So um, I, I, I'm going to make a recommendation and then um, we'll, um, we'll see where we are. Uh, I would recommend that this committee concur in IACRE's recommendations to adopt the CLA's recommendations 1A, 1B as amended, 2B, and 4 through 10, and adopt a new recommendation uh, number three, which would read, as follows, funds provided under a contract awarded pursuant to this section may not be used to provide legal services to an individual whose removal is being sought when the government is seeking such removal pursuant to any of the following sections of the United States Code, unless otherwise stated herein. A, 8 U.S.C. section 1227 A2A which involves final conviction of crimes of moral turpitude and aggravated felonies. If the individual received a sentence of more than one year and the sentence was not suspended. B, 8 U.S.C. section 1227 A2D4, which involves final conviction of miscellaneous crimes. If the underlying conviction was for human trafficking, or pimping. C, 8 U.S.C. section 1227 A2E, which involves final conviction of crimes of domestic violence, stalking, or violation of protection order, and crimes against children. And D, 8 U.S.C. section 1227 A2F, which involves final conviction of crime of the crime of trafficking. Now, notwithstanding all of that, such funds, city's funds, may be used in such cases, however, for the purpose of seeking a waiver for victims of domestic violence pursuant to 8 U.S.C. Section 1227A7, or if the final conviction has been expunged pursuant to state or federal law. So in any of those cases that I've mentioned, if someone has been convicted of a previous felony, but that felony was expunged, if the sentence was suspended, if the sentence was less than a year, um, that person could still seek uh, legal assistance with the funds that the city provides uh, pursuant to this. Uh, Second. So the point of this, <clears throat> members, is this eliminates any need for the attorneys uh, to do background checks. They can simply look at what the grounds are for removal, and then they will in these limited circumstances, they'll know whether or not the city of Los Angeles uh, funds can be used. So um, that would be 
my recommendation. And then, of course, also in, uh, uh, including the amendments proposed by uh, Ms. Rodriguez and Mr. Blumenfield. And so, uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Mr. De Leon. Yeah, just one quick question, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, just want to make sure I, I know the the various motions that we have before us uh, will be up for a vote right now. Uh, could we split the question on the various motions that are before us? Sure. Uh, how would you? Yeah, I, I'm happy to do it however you would like. Um, so, shall we vote separately on uh, um, the? How about uh, first on Mr. Blumenfield and Ms. Rodriguez's uh, proposals? Yes, um, I, I, I I I caught Mr. Rodriguez's proposal. If I could get Mr. Blumenfield's uh, proposal, if you could just really quickly uh, just refresh my memory on that one. Uh, I'm happy to, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. Yes, go right ahead, Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, it, it, I, I think it's fairly straightforward. It's just asking for a report to amend the CLA report to instruct the CLA and CAO to identify non-general fund dollars to continue this and expand this pilot program and to seek additional federal and state funding sources. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as, as we you prepare us, uh, Mr. Chair, if, before we actually go on the vote and, and go through the various, you know, uh, splitting the question, if you could just uh, remind us one uh, A and and two B and so forth, sure. you know, three and so forth, and and obviously Mr. Blumenfields and Ms. Monica Rodriguez's. Okay, be happy to do that. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Mr. Price, did, your hand is up. Did you want to comment again? Mr. Price? Question about the amendment, your amendment, uh, Mr. Yes. Chair? Yes. Could you restate that again? Yeah, the essence of it, I'm sorry, yeah, I don't. Yeah, the, yes, yes, let, let me explain it if I can. Yeah. Um, the, part of the problem uh, that, the, uh, that the attorneys have faced is that the council's exclusionary, original exclusionary language listed a number of crimes. Um, so, but it didn't specify when those crimes had occurred, where they'd occurred, and so on. And so they were left with the situation of having to exclude people from legal services based on background checks that they had to do regardless of what the basis for seeking removal was. Um, and so they even had to do background checks in the home country to make sure that the person hadn't been you know, convicted of, of one of these itemized crimes. I don't think that's what the council had ever intended uh, to, to be. I think what the council, I know, what the council intended by uh, these exclusions was to only exclude the use of city funds when the purpose of the removal was based on crimes that had been committed in the United States. I, 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 and, and only these specified crimes, not every crime, these specified crimes. So what I did with this is I tied um, those specified crimes to the federal uh, immigration law sections that make reference to those crimes as being a grounds for deportation. And so essentially, if the government is not asserting one of those grounds as a grounds for deportation, then the city funds can be used without any further consideration. So if, if the government is seeking uh, removal for some other reason, but the person happens to have a criminal background, these city funds can still be used in defense of that person in the in the immigration courts. So the idea is to narrow the exclusion only to those federal statutes that are themselves based on the itemized crimes that the council was concerned about um, initially. So crimes, cr significant felonies, crimes of violence, crimes against children, human trafficking, those sorts of things, and only in the case where they've received a, a final conviction and a sentence of greater than a year, and that sentence has not been suspended or expunged. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Sure, my, my pleasure. Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to, to thank you for that amendment um, because I was very uh, taken by the argument that folks were making that we were wasting dollars on... Yeah on the screening process. And that, that 
nobody wants to spend, I, I would hope, nobody wants to waste our dollars on screening folks when those dollars should be helping folks. Um, so, you know, coming into this, I was thinking, okay, well, let's, it's costing us so much, it's not worth it. Uh, but you've come up with a way, it sounds, to make it very simple uh, so that they don't have to um, spend that time. So that you, it, it's a simple screen where, you know, as we talked about, this is a privilege. We're only going to be able to serve a certain number of people um, given this limited program until we identify the actual dollars to make it real. Uh, so I think that that makes sense, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to support your amendment, um, you know, in as much as we're, we're, create, we're getting rid of that inefficiency because, as I mentioned, that was, when, as folks brought that up, I didn't think it was worth it for us to be wasting time um, sorting through folks. And this, this changes that and makes it much more clear. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes, uh, Mr. Gregorian, I just, I want to thank you for uh, really, I think, uh, using the scalpel approach to get to what we needed to get to uh, with this amendment and help to eliminate what would have otherwise been inefficient and, uh, you know, restrictive or at least, uh, you know, not cost effective for uh, for those that are, are providing these services and this work, but helping us to still address uh, what is a concern is that we will, you know, to assure that these funds won't be applied and used by individuals who uh, have committed these types of, uh, of crimes. And so uh, I just want to thank you for doing the, the, the heavy lift on, on uh, finding the right, an elegant solution to, uh, to this uh, challenge before us. And um, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, I, I look forward to supporting this amendment. Okay, thank you very much. So with that members, um, what I'd like to suggest is that the first thing we vote on um, collectively is uh, concurring in the I acres on the I acre committee's recommendations. Mr. Chair, if I, yes. if I may interject and uh, help you out here. Um, we can vote on all of these amendments and instructions separately into four votes. And I think it would be best if we vote on Councilmember Rodriguez's amendment first, then followed by Councilmember Blumenfield's and followed by uh, your amendment, sir. And then lastly, we can confirm uh, and to concur with Immigrant Affairs, Civil Rights and Equity Committee's re uh, recommendations as amended. Uh Okay, I was thinking of going in the opposite order only because I don't know what we're amending otherwise. So, so the amendments would be to the the recommendations then, I guess, right? That's correct. So, so if if the amendments proposed are recommendations to the CLA's recommendations, then yes, I, we can pr proceed in that order. So let's let's do. I'm going to follow your advice, Mr. So. Let's go ahead with that. Great, sir. Um, so I guess uh, if we were to take the vote now. Um, Per your instruction, uh, we are voting on Councilmember uh, Rodriguez's amendment. And uh, if I were to restate that, just so that everyone is on the same page, it, I believe it is to instruct the CAO and the CLA and request the County Office of Immigrant Affairs to include in the Memorandum of Understanding a provision to allocate $250,000 to provide support for veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces who are facing deportation. If, if that's, is that correct, Ms. Rodriguez? That's correct, thank you. Great, um, and Mr. Chair, if, uh, if I may, I'll proceed with the roll call vote. Please. Councilmember Kukorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield? Aye. Councilmember De Leon? Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Price? Aye. Five votes, and that amendment is accepted. Um, next, we'll move on to Councilmember Blumenfield's amendment, and I will restate that as well. I believe it is to amend the CLA report to add an instruction to instructing the CLA and CAO to identify non-general fund dollars and seek additional federal and state funding sources. Is that correct, Mr. Blumenfield? Yes. Perfect. And if I may, I'll move on to the roll call vote. 
Please. Councilmember Kukorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield? Aye. Councilmember De Leon? Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Price? Aye. Perfect. And then fine. We will now move on to Councilmember Kukorian's amendment. And I will reiterate that as well. <clears throat> and the amendment is to uh, is to state that the funds provided under a co contract awarded pursuant to this section may not be used to provide legal services to an individual whose removal is being sought when the government is seeking such removal pursuant to any of the following sections of the United States Code, unless otherwise stated herein. A. 8 U.S.C. Section 1227A 2A, final conviction of crimes of moral turpitude and aggravated felonies. If the individual received a sentence of more than one year and the sentence was not suspended. B. 8 U.S.C. Section 1227A 2D 4, final conviction of miscellaneous crimes. If the underlying conviction was for human trafficking or pimping. C. 8 U.S.C. Section 1227A2E, final conviction of crimes of domestic violence, stalking, or violation of protection order, and crimes against children. D. 8 U.S.C. Section 1227A2F, final conviction of crime of trafficking. Such funds may be used in such cases, however, for the purpose of seeking a waiver of, for victims of domestic violence pursuant to 8 U.S.C. Section 1227A7, or if the final conviction has been expunged pursuant to state or federal law. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Perfect. And if, my, if I may, I'll move on to the roll call vote as well. Yes. Councilmember Kukorian? Aye. Councilmember Bloomfield? Aye. Councilmember De Leon? I am a no. Just want to state one quick thing is that we did on this file item expand now uh, the exclusions, but uh, for LAJF, but I am a no. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Price. No. The vote is 3 2. The amendment passes. And the final instruction is to concur with the Immigrant Affairs. Uh, Civil Rights and Equity Committee's recommendations to adopt CLA's recommendations 1A, 1B as amended, 2B, and 4 through 10. And it will be amended uh, by Councilmember Blumenfield's amendment, Councilmember Rodriguez's amendment, and Councilmember Kokorian's amendment. And I will do the roll call vote now. Councilmember Kokorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Price. Aye. Five ayes, and the item is approved as amended. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, members. That was um, was an interesting and robust debate, and I appreciate your seeing it through. So thank you very much. Um, that brings us next to the FSR. Sir, item number nine is the CAO report relative to the third financial status report for fiscal year 2020-21. Nicholas Campbell will be presenting for our office. Sorry about that. I accidentally muted. Uh, Mr. Campbell, please uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council members. My name is Nick Campbell with the Office of the CAO. I'm here to present the third or mid-year financial status report. Uh, the major theme of this FSR is that while current year overspending is manageable, the need to use the reserve fund for critical city programs during this fiscal year has greatly diminished the reserve fund balance, and the city has less flexibility to address remaining overspending, unforeseen future overspending, and to maintain elevated service levels in 22-23. Additionally, the recommendations of this report, as well as the recommendations of the gang injunction curfew settlement report pending consideration by full council, will deplete the UB reserve for mid-year adjustments account. In light of this reduced flexibility to address overspending, our office strongly recommends the preservation of the reserve fund balance to the greatest extent feasible. 
The city is still regaining its financial footing after the pandemic, but there are still potential challenges ahead, including some challenges identified in this report. For the American Plan, or excuse me, the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, uh, in this report, we provide an update on the status of ARPA funds and reporting to the Treasury Department, as well as a summary of the final rule regarding ARPA released by the Treasury rel relative to the eligible uses of ARPA funds. The final rule does not negatively impact the approach the city has taken relative to these funds, and we do not recommend changing that approach at this time. For revenue, uh, December receipts are approximately $14 million below plan, which is largely driven by below plan receipts for property tax, business tax, parking fines, and grant receipts. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that we will finish the year below plan. There are main downside risks to property tax and business tax. These receipts are generally received in the second half of the year and face lagging impacts from the pandemic. On the expenditure side, uh, most departments reported finished the year within budget or with year-end surpluses, mostly attributed to salary savings and challenges in filling vacancies. In tables two and three on pages nine and 11 respectively, we report a total budget gap of $81 million, comprised of $80 million in projected overspending for departmental and non-departmental budgets, and approximately $750,000 in general fund subsidies anticipated for special fund revenue shortfalls. The largest changes in overspending since the second FSR are attributed to the police and fire departments. Some of the overall uh, overspending was anticipated and funding was provided in the UB for such purposes. This report includes recommendations to address $13.8 million of this budget gap and identifies $31 million in potential future actions, which would reduce the budget gap from $81 million to $36.3 million, which is a management excuse me, a manageable level, but it should be emphasized that we have reduced flexibility to address this overspending, considering the reductions to the reserve fund balance and the anticipated depletion of the UB reserve from your adjustments account. Uh, for reserves, our cumulative reserves are at 8.1%, which is below our 10% policy target, and the reserve fund itself is at 6.49% after accounting for the recommendations of the mid-year FSR, which is above our 5% reserve fund policy. It should be noted that the reserve fund is down 118.8 million since the second FSR. And additionally, the reserve fund is anticipated to drop further to 6.14%, uh, assuming the approval of pe two pending reports for the one for the front funding of the extension of the of project room key and the delayed implementation costs of the human resources and payroll project. We strongly urge again to you to preserve the remaining reserve fund balance to maintain our flexibility to address the remaining overspending we have identified, unforeseen future overspending, and to maintain elevated surface levels in 22-23. In the issues of concern section, we discuss the potential future challenges related to costs associated with major special events, the COVID-19 vaccination and reporting requirements, employee union negotiations, the fiscal impact from delayed implementation of the human resources and payroll project, the impact of inflation on operational costs, and this is both the observed and anticipated inflation, uh, the use of one-time revenues for ongoing spending and outside council costs. Of particular note are the potential challenges associated with the impact of employee union negotiations and inflation. Uh, for departmental budgets, as I mentioned earlier, most departments reported finishing the year within budget or with surplus funds. However, in some department narratives, we also identified some issues of concern which may have impacts on the departmental budgets. At the, in the last few sections of the report, uh, we have a section for gas tax where we discuss the status of the special gas tax improvement fund, including a preliminary projection of an $11.8 million revenue shortfall associated with the increased gas prices observed since the invasion of Ukraine. This report includes recommendations to address approximately $800,000 of this anticipated shortfall um, and the remainder would be addressed in the year end. For the road maintenance and rehabilitation funds, we discuss the status of, of these funds, uh, also known as SB1 funds, and present recommendations to partially address the maintenance of effort requirements the city must meet this fiscal year to retain eligibility for an estimated $89 million in SB1 funding for 22-23. Uh, and finally, uh, in section seven, we report on the status of the Mikla commercial paper program. I'm happy to answer any questions on this report, uh, as well as along with any other analysts and department representatives who are on this call. Thank you. Uh, and just to add, we do have a couple uh, amendments to two recommendations.
which I can read in at whichever time the committee would prefer. Those are, you know, we, I think we can wait until uh, we conclude uh, for the amendments. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, before we get to questions, um, I did want to just take a moment to see if members wanted to call any specific departments special for departmental questions. Um, so that we can let everybody else go uh, if we don't uh, have questions for them. So uh, do you have any departments that you want to call, Ms. Rodriguez? Uh, yes, both uh, police and, and fire. Okay. Mr. Blumenfield, any departments you want to call especially? No, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Price, any Okay, so Mr. Price, Mr. Any, any departments, uh, any special departments that you want to call special for the for questions nothing for the office? Nothing at this time. Okay, so uh, police and fire, uh, we're going to need you shortly. Uh, everybody else, keep an ear to the meeting, but uh, other than that, you can go. Um, all right, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, you're you're up for questions. Thank. you. You. Well, this might actually be able to be answered by Mr. Campbell, but how much of the expenditures associated with uh, public safety resources are eligible or amongst uh, all the expenditures are eligible for um, FEMA reimbursement? And, you know, what are we, where, where are we <laughs> uh, on that front? Um, I do not actually have a set figure I would uh, be able to me. I would uh, defer to the analysts for fire and police um, okay. to give you more specifics on that. I don't know if you want to do that now or wait until they come up. Yeah, no, we can we can go ahead and do that now since we only have the two departments. Let's, let's do Thank it all you. collectively. Okay, I guess starting with fire, just in alpha order. Good afternoon. Uh, Emilio Rodriguez with the uh, Fire Department, Administrative Services Bureau. With regard to the amount of our um, departmental deficit that can be attributed uh, for which uh, can be uh, for which uh, reimbursements can be expected at the FEMA level, um, a lot of our uh, disbursements for COVID since July of 2021 have been around variable staffing overtime. Uh, the bulk of the activity was from July through December when much of the COVID division was a uh, ramping down. So we spent approximately 4 million in a variable staffing overtime, uh, you know, much of which we can expect to be reimbursed. Uh, the department is reporting to the CO regularly uh, on those expenditures. Um, there were also uh, expense items for continuing rentals. We had the porta potties, the uh, equipment that's out in the field. Again, mo most of that has been phased out but um, that's been uh, uh, reported to the uh, CAO as well. Uh, so collectively, uh, it's uh, you know roughly around four and a half million uh, for this fiscal year alone, which which uh, can be expected uh, for reimbursement. Terrific, thank you. Anything else, Ms. Rodriguez? No, that was it for fire. And if I could uh, chat with PD. Good afternoon. So Tom Brennan from LAPD's fiscal group. As it relates to COVID nineteen or COVID nineteen expenditures, uh, the department has amassed about one point three million in overtime expenditures that we will be submitting uh, for the theme of reimbursement. Thank you. And Tom, I know we just uh, we were just exchanging with uh, respect to some of the overtime expenditures associated with uh, Super Bowl and whatnot. Um, has there been an early estimate on the Summit of the Americas that is uh, impending and what negotiations, uh, if any, have been negotiated or secured in advance uh, to protect our uh, our expenditures on overtime? At this point, we, we have not uh, done a an actual estimate. We are kind of basing that estimate based on the uh, based on the time frame that the Summit of the Americas will run. 
a period of time that will be active. We're looking at what we expended for Super Bowl to be our guide. So proportionately about the same amount okay. in overtime and uh, regular salaries that we're going to use to, to staff the event. Okay. Um, and so, I'm, well, apropos that that would be the model because this was this will be our other Super Bowl, if uh, if you will. Um, what it, what if any? Are there any reimbursable costs associated with that from the federal government as being a host city for uh, the summit? I'm not aware of what the discussions have been at this point as to the potential reimbursement. And is that with the feds or is it with? Uh, what what agency would be considered the host agency for it? Or do we inherently just uh, get saddled with that uh, because we're the host city? My understanding is the Convention and Tourist Bureau is one that is working on those negotiations with the feds. Okay. Okay. So then we will have that conversation. Thank you very... And, and then uh, similarly, then we would have to execute a... Uh, an agreement with them in the same manner that we did with the uh, post committee for the NFL, correct, for the Super Bowl? I would expect so, but I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work if the feds are the, the entity that would be conducting the reimbursement or providing okay. the reimbursement. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. I'm just, um, just following up and just surprised by that. Um, I would assume that we would get the security allowance for, for the summit, just as we do for other major events. So, but I'm looking forward to hearing back on that. I just, uh, I'm very surprised by that. I, I thought that was a done deal that we were getting reimbursed for some of that, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, members, anything? Further for CAO. Okay. Um, then I guess we can uh, go now uh, to the proposed amendments. I think, Mr. Campbell, you mentioned that uh, the CAO has some proposed amendments. You can go ahead and read those in now. Yes, we do. Um, for recommendation 10, uh, the amendment would be to replace that recommendation uh, with the following um, to authorize the controller to decrease appropriations of $383,961 within the Community Investment for Families Department number 100 slash 21, uh, comma salaries general account number 10, uh, 001010, and decrease appropriations within the Community Development Trust Fund number 424 slash 21, Community Investment for Families Department account number 21V121 by a like amount. And the second one is to replace recommendation number 18B related to the, uh, uh, the Bureau of Street Services. This would be to reduce appropriations in the total amount of $6 million in the Bureau of Street Services fund number 100 slash 86 within account number 001010, salaries general 3.5 million, account number 001070, uh, salaries as needed, 500000 and account number 003030, uh, construction expense, $2 million. And that is the two recommendations. Great. Uh, members, any questions uh, about those amendments or objections? I see no objections. So with that, if there's no further discussion or questions, Ms. Rodriguez, your hand is up. Do you, do you mean it still be? Okay. If there's no further discussion, we can go ahead and uh, call the roll on the CAO's recommendations on the FSR as amended. Councilmember Kukorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember DeLeon? Absent. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Price? Aye. Four ayes, and the item is approved as amended. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, that, I believe, Mr. Sugg, completes our open session items, does it not? That's correct, sir. All right. Let's go ahead and proceed then into closed session. I will prepare the room. Thank you. Thank you.
Very good. Uh, the Budget and Finance Committee is now back in open session. Uh, Mr. So, what remains before us? The desk is clear, sir. Very good. There being no other business before the committee, we are adjourned.